And now we are welcoming Gaël Barocco. So uh, Gaël is a researcher at the French Institute for Research in Computer Science and Automation, where he's using machine learning to link cognition with brain activity. For more than 10 years, he's been a key contributor and director, director of uh, Scikit-Learn, one of the most prominent Python library for machine learning, in case you don't know. <laughs> Uh, he is also a member of the advisory board, director of the Scikit-Learn operations at the INRIA Foundation. So, thank you, Gail. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for the invitation. Thank you for organizing this workshop. And thank you to everybody for, for being here. Uh, so, my talk is a bit echoing the previous one. Not, not exactly, so it's interesting. It's uh, uh, going to be slightly more technical and slightly more focused on on your science, though it is a lot of general considerations. And so, uh, you know, when I was asked for a title, I thought, well, I want to talk about reproducibility because it's something that matters to people. And I want to go a bit in the technical aspects of reproducibility, so in the computational and statistical aspects. And I want to frame this in the, the framing of data intensive neuroscience, which is things I do. Uh, so, uh, neuroscience. I guess we all agree it's about understanding the brain. Uh, it's really a wide scope. It really goes from biology to psychology. And there's a lot of computer science in it these days. I'd like to stress this because uh, the ep epistemological silos of, uh, well, foundations of uh, biology, psychology, math are different ones, as was uh, mentioned by Laura just before, and it's, it's quite important. Now, if we take a step back, and we think about science in general. Uh, how do we define it? Well, I define, I personally define science as a method. It's really the, the tool that we can all use to discover knowledge and mechanism. And we can argue on the, the, the boundaries of a specific discipline, but I think we can agree on the general ideas of the scientific process. So it's about all the method. And it's important to stress this these days. I really feel it's important to stress this these days because we all feel that science as a method is under attack for many reasons, you know, global warming. The, the, the process of science is not accepted by all and under attack by people like some politicians. And so this is, you know, a quote that the president, the CEO of uh, the AAAS, that's the American Association for the Advancement of Science. I believe they ran the Science Journal. And uh, so that's what he was um, uh, uh, telling the, the House Committee on, on Science uh, last year. And I guess, you know, one of the reasons it's important is that uh, science is going to have a hard time in the US under the current administration. So why is it important? Because it helps shaping society. <clears throat> and it can go wrong in this process. So uh, you might all know about this study. Uh, so Andrew Wakefield et al. published in uh, 98 a study on how autism was caused by vaccines. Now, it turns out that this study is a recognized fraud. It's, it's a clear and conscious fraud. It's not a mistake. That's a fraud. However, it is helping people undermine vaccines. And, and we can see in, in modern countries that the amount of vaccination is going down. And these days we have in Europe, uh, uh, in some places, a measles outbreak. So my point here is that, uh, I, I, I hope that everybody in this audience kind of believes in, in vaccines, I do. Uh, uh, so my, my point is that science is a process that makes us understand things like, biology that uh, underlies uh, va vaccines. Uh, as a consequence, we can modify how we as a society work. If there's lost in science, it's extremely costly. And uh, we as scientists are uh, hurt by uh, this loss in, in science. We're hurt in our ability to improve the world that surrounds us. Uh, so, you know, that leads us to the ideas of uh, reproducibility. Uh, science has always been based on, on data. Well, maybe not math, but most of natural sciences. It's okay, I'm partly a mathematician, so I don't mind. Uh, uh, so if you think, you know, how do I go from data to, to conclusions? Well, good process is, is reproducibility. I think we can, we can agree on this, but what I, I want to go into is that better process is generalization and reuse. I'm not going to go into, you know, 
arguments about definitions. For instance, the definition of reproducibility versus replication, you've got two trends and they swap the definitions in, in publications. No, no point arguing about, about words. I just want to you know, discuss about concepts. And I'll first start with statistical points uh, that I'll ground uh, on, on neuroscience and then I'll, I'll bring to computational points. So let's start with statistical reproducibility. Uh, so we have a lot of data these days. It's fantastic. It's actually literally exciting for me. Uh, uh, but that's not enough just to have you know, science emerge from this. And the, the sciences such as biology, neuroscience, psychology rely very explicitly on the idea of an explicit working hypothesis. You start a study with a working hypothesis. You acquire data to test this hypothesis to invalidate yes or no. It seems a bit, you know, a bit narrow-minded in this world where there's plenty of data and I can download it uh, from the web. So, why this tyranny? Why, why do we have to have a working hypothesis? Well, the point is, if you're just going to look at correlation in the data, you can just find correlations by chance. And there's this awesome website. I don't know if you know it. You can, you can Google it up. It just finds correlation. It finds uh, by chance correlations in, in time series in the US. And so here you have a correlation, a quite nice correlation between suicides by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation, and US spendings in science, uh, space, and technology. Right. And you'll find things like the number of times that uh, some actor appeared in a, in a movie or things like this. Okay, so we don't really believe this. The reason we don't really believe this is we just think it's is due to chance. And it's really a problem of, uh, sorry, I don't know my slides well. Oh. I'm lost in my slides, okay. Uh, this thing doesn't work as, as I thought. Okay, so the problem is really uh, multiple comparisons. So here's my XKCD slide. Uh, uh, so in this slide, you see uh, scientists trying on to find a link between purple jelly beans and acne, and then brown jelly beans, and pink, and blue, and teal, and salmon, and red, and turquoise, and magenta, and yellow, and gray, and tan, and cyan, and gray, and mauve. And if you're French and you know all those color names, you're good in English. Anyhow, after a while, something pops up, right? That's a standard problem in statistics. It's multiple comparisons. So it's really the, the point that if you keep asking stupid questions to data, at some point, the data will say yes. So that's why we have a working hypothesis. It's as simple as that. The problem is it doesn't solve fully the problem. The first one is it leads to fragmentation of the problem. So. Here we have a common uh, a story, parable, uh, where we have uh, six different blind men who are looking at, well, not looking, who are trying to understand what an elephant is. So they're touching the elephant and they all come up with different stories because they're touching the elephant at different uh, uh, parts of his body. That's the first problem, it's the problem of reductionism. It's not the end of the day, but it's, it's part of the, the problem. But there's a bigger problem, which is that as a, as a, as a field, as a, uh, as a society of interacting scientists, we lose statistical control at the level of a whole field, at the level of the publication. And the reason is twofold. First, because there is Analytic variability, which means that to, you, we can ask the same question in many different ways because there are all kind of arbitrary choices that we make in our data uh, analysis. We have uncontrolled variance in, in, the, uh, in the results. So we're not controlling well the variance, we're not controlling well the p-values, the Bayesian posterior, you call it what you want, of the results. In itself, I don't see this as a problem. This should slow science, but not prevented from working. Now, add to this the publication incentives that make it that currently you cannot publish null findings or it's hard or you can't get them in high impact journals. You're, you're strongly incentivized, I am too, by the way, to f have high impact positive findings, which means that you immediately get into a confirmation bias. So you've got high variance, and selection bias on this, okay? 
So this point was made by John uh, Neonetis uh, in, a, in a paper that's called, I believe this one is called The Why Most Published Findings Are Wrong. I read it a few years ago and I thought it was outrageous and binned it. And then I read it again and thought, well, there's a lot of good ideas in it. So the, the, the point is simple, I'm going to remake it. It's really hard to control the statistical validity of what we do because there's so many arbitrary choices. Not impossible, but hard. And we have a selection bias due to publication that completely undermines what we can't control. Okay? Which means that at the level of a field, in the current practices, we just can't control that working hypotheses are well tested. So I have a solution. Uh, the point being that the important aspect of uh, scientific theory is that it generalizes. That's the common definition of the th scientific theory. So we, a bunch of people, think that what should be put forward is generalization. And uh, I happen to be a researcher in machine learning, so of course I see this as a machine learning problem, but it's a broader problem than this. The point being, it's not only about statistical validity of an analysis, it's about statistical validity of the interpretation. Do my conclusions that are slightly more abstract than my analysis, do they generalize to a new setting? Currently, this is done with words. Can I do this in a testable way? And that means testing models on new experiments, on new data, on new paradigm. So the, we think that's a conceptually important way forward in terms of reproducibility crisis. And just to say that if you go back to uh, People who talk about science in many different sciences, this is Stephen Hawking, so uh, astrophysicist, cosmologist, uh, there's really this agreement that a good theory describes the data but generalizes to new settings. Okay? So how do you uh, implement this in your science? Well, we've been trying to do this for a little while, so I can talk about things we've done. One thing that we've done is that we've looked at uh, we've looked at how cognition, cognitive processes are represented in the brain, which is something quite classic in, in functional neuroimaging. And what we've done is that we've, we've tried to show that we could uh, learn a representation that would predict uh, uh, cognitive operations in new experiments that are unrelated to the ones where we learned that representation. So that's one as aspect of explicit generalization. And why is it uh, useful? Because it gives evidence that's beyond a specific paradigm. Because it gives you something that you can test without r r completely reproducing what we've, we've done. With you know, varying minor things. And another more obvious example is if you're looking at pathologies, a good biomarker is a biomarker that generalizes. If I have a biomarker that works in my scanning center, but not in yours. Maybe it's going to give me a nature publication, but it's really not a useful biomarker, and we should value it. We should value things that, that generalize. And really, the, the point here is, being, is to generalize beyond heterogeneity. So that's what I call strong generalization. Now, the bad news, as I said, you know, machine learning would fix, it, it would fix the reproducibility problem in terms of statistics, but of course it doesn't. Uh, what I'm showing you here is the reported prediction accuracy in the literature as a function of the sample size of the study for different pathologies. And what you see is that, in general, the bigger the sample size, the smaller the reported accuracy. Why is this? Well, if you don't have a lot of data, you can vary all kind of arbitrary aspects uh, of your uh, analysis pipeline. And as with a little amount of data, you're going to have an observed prediction accuracy that varies widely. Even if you do things somewhat reasonably well in, in terms of machine learning, so we're doing cross-validation. Okay? So now, so this is a, a, a graph that I made where I varied stupid thing like how much I smoothed my data. And I observed uh, uh, how, how much things varied. And here on this data, I had flipped one label out of two, so the prediction accuracy should be 50%. So 
So if I, if I vary all these things, these are very reasonable things to vary. If I vary all these things and I take the best predictive uh, pipeline, I'm reporting 71% on something that should be a chance. Now the problem is we all do this. I do this, you probably do this. So we have a problem. We all vary the way we process data to get our answers. I don't have another solution to that one, by the way, that other than we need, uh, we need consensus on methods uh, and we need to establish those consensus very slowly by working very, very hard. No magic, uh, magic bullet. Which leads me to my other point about computational reproducibility. Uh, so basically computers. So the, the, the definition was covered by, by Laura just before. It's basically can I rerun things and obtain the same results? So we can call this reproducibility or, or replicability, uh, and uh, the argument really uh, uh, is that we should script everything and we should keep everything that we script. That's quite important. If we don't do this, we can't even reproduce what we've done ourselves. Now the problem is that uh, if we just do this and we just you know copy processing scripts again and again and again. Uh, this is going to be reproducible, but it's going to be impossible to analyze because I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, code gathers dust. It just gets craftier and craftier as we go. Because code is something that needs to be curated. It needs to be cleaned. It needs to be maintained. And so just copying scripts does not scale. It just a failure. Sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Hmm. Where am I? Here? Here. Yeah. Uh, so instead of reproducibility, I would rather uh, aim for reusability. Can I do scripts that you can reuse easily rather than just copy them and reuse them without understanding them? So the, the, the point being, can I apply those scripts to a new problem? Am I able to understand them, to modify them, to run them in a new setting? And it's back to the point being that it's all about generalization. So once we, we make this point, then as a software engineer, my answer is what we need are libraries. The point I'm trying to make is that, yes, we can have reproducibility, exact reproducibility, by just archiving everything we have, but that's not going to give us new science. That's just going to freeze the science that we have. So we need to curate these data processing scripts into libraries. And of course, I'm, uh, I'm pitching for my own work because I've been working on libraries uh, for <laughs> almost two decades. Uh, uh, but um, the reason I've been doing this is because I think it's extremely important. And maybe I'll, I'll touch a few words on, on what we've done as a community, uh, where we are now, and what were the challenges. And so I can take two examples that I've been involved in. One is a scikit-learn, so it's uh, one of the most used uh, machine learning toolbox uh, in Python. And the goal was to make uh, research, our initial goal was really to make research in machine learning usable to people who did not understand them. That was why we started Scikit-Learn uh, more than 10 years ago. I think it's been successful uh, in this respect. And another endeavor, which is slightly more focused, is uh, Nylearn. So uh, the goal here is to make it easy to understand brain imaging problems with machine learning. Those two libraries are in Python because uh, to make things easy to reproduce, we think that uh, we shouldn't have to buy a, a software, so we didn't go for MATLAB. So there are many challenges, uh, but maybe one of the biggest challenges of scikit-learn is that it's about good statistics, and it's more about good statistics than about good coding. And I guess the challenge of Nylearn is adoption by people who are adverse to technology. Uh, so this, the, good, the good thing is that if you do something like this well, you have a huge impact. And I didn't update this slide, so we have more than half a million of users that return to the documentation uh, uh, every month. And our number of citations is ridiculous. Uh, we're used both by the industry and by academia. So I, I need to hurry up. Uh, 
uh, just the point I want to make here is just that it takes a lot of work to make a library from research code, and it's easy to uh, underestimate this this uh, this amount of work. It's also really interesting work because it forces you to do better job in terms of numerical stability, in terms of supporting multiple platforms, in terms of documentation. Uh, uh, and it, it forces you to do different trade-offs and not to focus only on the science, but on why it's useful. As mentioned before, uh, we should adopt good software practices such as version control or automated testing. That's the only way we're going to have things that are re reliable. And the last point, uh, being open source is crucial. And the reason it's crucial is because we shouldn't work alone on, on such a tool. We need a community that's going to give much wider scope to the tool. Uh, I believe that Scikit-Learn is the new machine learning textbook. People learn machine learning thanks to Scikit-Learn. And I think this is the way of the future for computational science. Textbooks should not matter. It should be about good libraries and good documentation. So I would like Nylon to be the new neuroimaging review literature. I think that's slightly, uh, slightly uh, uh, more challenging. Uh, of course, this, is, this raises a lot of challenges uh, to find the good data, to have the right computational power, uh, and the good thing is it forces us to distill the literature, to narrow it down. And we've try been trying to do similar things with a SciPy lecture, the timeout, fine, wasn't interesting anyhow. So just to summarize, in terms of statistical Reproducibility, I would rather aim for generalization than reproducibility. Reproducibility should be the First thing, and then we should focus on generalization. In terms of uh, uh, computational reproducibility, I don't want frozen fruit. I don't want you to deep freeze a computer and keep it uh, in your basement. Uh, I want you to aim for reusability. And to end on a positive note, if we do this well, this fosters innovation. It really does. It creates a thriving community of people who can easily test and exchange ideas. And I really think this can stimulate a, a science.